title of the message this evening is called Movement. Everybody say movement. I want to begin with a scripture out of Matthew chapter 16. I haven't uh, given it to Edwin or the guys in the back, so I'm going to just take off and read it. Let's give the Lord thanks for his wonderful grace and his marvelous mercy. Amen. One of the things that uh, the Lord reminded me of today as I sat in my office and uh, just thought about many things over the years how the prophets have spoke to me over the years and God took time out of his busy schedule to to speak to my heart directly. And as I began to ponder some of those prophetic words that the Lord spoke to me, I remember a prophet who came to the church. It was on a Sunday night. He came to the church, but we had passed each other in the hallway earlier that evening and and, uh, our eyes just exchanged as we passed each other. No words were exchanged, but our eyes said quite a bit. And in the middle of the service, he, when he got up and he called me and he says, he called my name and he asked me to come forward and he says, I've come here for you. And he says, let me tell you what the Lord says. He says, the Lord says tonight, I'm stripping you of your stripes. And the Lord said that you are a five-star general in the spirit. And he gave me a pack of five stars, general stars. Then I remember not too long after that, another prophet came to the town by the name of Fergus McIntyre. He was from Australia. And Fergus called me up and he says, I got a word of the Lord from you. And he says, I see you punching big holes in the realm of the spirit. And he says, I see you like a racking ball in the spirit. And he said some other things, but that just caught me. Then I was at another place and not too long ago, glory of Zion, and I got another word. And sister said, I see you as a jackhammer. And I see you breaking ground wherever you go. So I was just sitting there today in my office and I was pondering many words that the Lord had given me over the years. And I think it set the stage for the message that I bring to you tonight. So I'm going to begin reading at uh, Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to begin with verse 1, going, I'm going to go to verse 3. The title of the message, once again, is called Movement. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him, talking about Jesus, asking him, asking that he would give them a sign from heaven. They wanted to see a supernatural sign. They were testing him. And he answered and he said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left and departed. That's serious talk. Jesus says no sign will be given to that generation except for the sign. So in other words, Jesus prophesied how that generation would end up. In John's gospel, chapter 8, verse 32, these words. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, it's interesting to me that any time the church opens, there's obviously other things for people to be doing. And it is even more interesting to me that Jesus ascended into heaven, then he comes back, And they walk out to to the mountain of God where the law of God was given. And 500 people followed him out. And so Jesus tells them to go back into the upper room. And he says, wait for the promise of the Father. And so between there, as they watched him ascend into the clouds out of their eyesight, between there and going back to the upper room, only 120 were there. So it makes me wonder what happened to the 380 between there and there. 
So the word that I bring to you tonight carries a prophetic mandate. I have prophesied what I believe the scripture affirms that a last day movement of Holy Spirit is coming that will be greater than Pentecost. Don't want you to miss Pentecost Sunday. We're going to be talking about what's been happening up to Pentecost. Such things that does not come to pass without opposition. In other words, let me say it to you again. I believe scripture affirms that the last day movement of Holy Spirit is coming. That will be greater than Pentecost. Such a thing does not come to pass without opposition. Without opposition. Much of my spiritual journey in the Lord has been experienced in the prophetic and the discerning of spirits. In the areas of deliverance ministry. Discerning of spirits is an important spiritual gift for every believer to be proficient in. God wants us to have it, and we are to desire to eagerly, to eagerly pursue it. And it is vital for all aspects of walking in the blessed and the abundant life. It is also important in the realm of spiritual warfare. There can be no spiritual warfare if there can be no discerning of spirits. There can be no accuracy. We have entered into the era of the body of Christ where the ability to discern between, between the true and the false has become increasingly difficult for many. This decade has been marked by double harvests. And with harvesting comes an exposing of deception, terrors, the scripture called them, and the love for the truth like never before, the wheat. And it's recorded in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, let me turn there, 13, and I'm going to begin with verse 24, Matthew's gospel, 13, verse 24. Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. Well, we know what the field is, and as we know, that is the place of Satan's domain. God said from the very beginning in the book of beginnings, in the book of Genesis, that Satan was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So when all the drama you see in this world around us is happening in the field. So we know who is the prince and the power of the air who operates in the field. So when Jesus tells them this parable, he wants them to understand what he is saying. Verse 26, but then the grain, uh, let me go back to verse 25. But while they slept, he says, his enemy came and he sowed tares among the wheat and he went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. In other words, they came together. It's almost like the sons of God who appeared before God. And God looks at all of these angels, all these billions and trillions of angels who appeared before him. And God spots Satan and says, where did you come from? And that is so interesting to me that he is able to transform himself into an angel of light and no one discerns right from wrong what he is and who he is. So Jesus says we are living in a day where we are no longer able to discern who comes into our midst. Because we've been conditioned and taught that we should love everything and everybody. And it is interesting that we've been deceived to think that we can have more love than God. How is that possible? It's a deception. So let me go back to this verse, verse 26. And when the grain has sprouted and produced a, a crop, it says, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and they said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? 
How then does these terrors? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. This red letters is Jesus. He says, an enemy has done this. And the servant said, do you want us? He says, do you want us to pull them up? Do you want us to deal with you? you want us to gather them and bungle them up? And Jesus is going to say, but he said, no. He says, at least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Interesting statement, isn't it? So will it be that, will it be that in these last days that the wheat and the tares will be so friendly with one another you won't know the difference? I agree, Apostle. Absolutely. Verse 30. He says, let them grow together until the harvest. So the prophets are declaring double harvest. So he says, let them grow together until the harvest. And at the end of the harvest, I say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bungles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 37. Verse 37 to 43. And he answered and he said to them, he who sows the good seed, now he's expounded on it, is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be at the end of this age. And he says, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather them out of his kingdom, and all things that offend those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace, into the furnace of fire, and there will be weeping and mashing of gashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he who has an ear, let him hear. These are days like no other. Holy Spirit is challenging prophetic people to understand his times and seasons and align ourselves to them properly. Or we will miss the fullness of what God is doing in the earth, and in the ecclesia. If the Lord says he will do a new thing, we must be careful not to allow a religious mindset of the past to cause us to resist a new paradigm. Many prophetic words today agree that we are in a key prophetic season as we enter the third great awakening. The previous two awakenings were seasons of great revival breaking out in times of great darkness. I believe that we are right now in the hour, in the hour of Isaiah chapter 60, 1, 2, 3, which declares that in the midst of great deception and darkness, the glory of the Lord will arise upon his people and shine out to the nations. Isaiah 60, 1, 2, 3, these words, Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to your brightness of your rising. I said earlier this year, right from this very pulpit, that I believe that your apostle will be sent to the nations very shortly. There's a call that is coming to his heart. And God has summoned him, summoning him to the nations. God is going to put a word in his heart that will speak to the nation. God spoke that to me and I believe that to be true. We have the greatest opportunity right now to rebuild on our biblical mandate to contain the outpouring of the outpouring God is about to send. John the Baptist. John the Baptist came, came on the scene proclaiming a great revival and he called people to prepare for a kingdom. 
As John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way, prophetic voices now rise to proclaim that the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit in history is coming, a movement of God. Now, I want you to hear that, a movement of God. Revival is life from death and wakening from slumber. It's for people who are already Christians. But a movement of Holy Spirit will be a tsunami wave of sweeping over everything before it. It cannot be contained by the walls of a church or held within a religious structure. A tsunami destroys everything in a moment. It washes away everything it touches and it carries everything to a different place. It cannot be resisted. The disciples in the upper room were in an emergency preparedness. Isaiah the prophet saw this this tidal wave in the realm of the spirit several hundred years earlier, and this is what he prophesied. Isaiah 59, 19, this is what he says. "So, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord or the wind of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him. I want you to hear that. That's important. In Zechariah 4, 6, these words. So he said to me, this is the word of Zerubbabel. He says, nor by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, these words. And so he said to me, or let me go back. It says, on that day of Pentecost was fully fulfilled. All the disciples were gathered in one place. And suddenly, now I want you to see the history of God's movement. I want you to see the history of God's tsunami coming in. I'm not talking about a revival. I'm talking about a a tidal wave of God's presence coming in and God doing what God does, taking over. I want you to hear that because that's how suddenly it will sweep through the church. How suddenly it will sweep upon the earth. Never think God will ever be defeated. God will never be defeated. His people will never be defeated. I want you to hear that. So it says, suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house, rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed upon each of them. And they were all filled and equipped with Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak a language they had never learned. And I often tell people, if you hear me speaking in a language that you don't understand, I'm probably not talking to you. In the spirit of John the Baptist, the message of preparation never changed in its essence. There must be a clear and a clean pathway, a place for the coming move of God to land, a foundation on which it can rest, a road that it can travel. Not every movement is marked by divine encounter or supernatural manifestations. Often they are simply different phases of the same process. Life is a series of changes, a process of going from the old to the new, from chronos to kairos. Growth, change, and revival is how life in the spirit connects itself. Preparing, sowing, believing, And preserving is all part of the shifting and the anticipating of the tsunami of God in the suddenness of God. The word for this hour 
is that the word for this hour that flows from heaven is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, these words, to live this is all the more urgent, for time is running out, and you know it is a st strategic hour in human history. It is time for us to wake up, for our full salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Night's darkness is dissolving away as a new day of destiny dawns. So we must once and for all strip away what is done in the shadows of darkness, removing it like filthy rags, and once and for all we clothe ourselves with the radiance of the light as a weapon. Instead of Apostle Paul using the Greek word chronos or mikairos, meaning a set time, an opportune time, an opportunity, a due season, a fixed or a special occasion, or the right time when the heaven and earth convenes. He uses another Greek word to describe the hour, the hour of time, and as hora meaning an hour to awake out of sleep. Horror is like, is like chronos in that it indicates a special point of time. The word is best defined at the present time or moment without further delay. That's what it means, without further delay, immediately at once. That's how the tsunami came in, immediately at once. And so they seen it on the radar that the earth, there was actually a, a earthquake beneath the sea. And it was at once, it pushed. It pushed with such great pressure like it was on the day of Pentecost. And it shook the earth. So God says, not only will I shake the heavens, but now I'm going to shake the earth. And so the tsunami came. And it came suddenly. And it came with such force that it just nauseated everything in its path. That's how God says, I'm bringing a movement upon this earth. You see, we've been preaching revival, and I think it's been good and right to do so. Because, because if we're not revived individually, we can never be revived corporately. And so, but God says, I'm going to cause a movement. To happen. I want you to know there's a grass movement taking place right now across the United States. There's a grass movement that is rising up. In John's gospel, Jesus' mother Mary came to him and asked him to do something about the wine problem. They had ran out of wine. And Jesus said, my hour, my horror has not come. Uh-oh. Jesus tells them, now let me go back and tell you again. So Paul uses another Greek word in the book of Romans chapter 13 when he tells us there's an urgency, when he tells us now is the time. So it's not kairos, it is, it is hola. And so Paul says, now I want you to get this word because he says these two words are in connection to each other. And so now Jesus' mother comes to him and she says to him, she says, I need you to do something. We got a wine problem here at this wedding. And they had run out of wine. And Jesus said, my hour, the Greek word horror, has not come. He says, my hour, horror, has not come. But Mary, knowing who her son was, reached into her kairos, opportune moment by faith and put it into the horror and a place and demanded that the anointing was upon his life. Move. I like a mama like that. Huh. <laughs> She came in her Kairos moment and said, your horror is now, now move. And then she turned to the servant and said, now do whatever huh. he tells you to do. That ended that discussion, didn't it? 
We have induced into the spiritual warfare. All of us have been inducted and induced into spiritual warfare, whether you like it or not. God never consulted none of us to whether we liked it or not. Induce means to be formally installed or put into a position or an office. God is telling, God is calling a muster alert, meaning an assemble of troops prepared for battle, to take a radical position against the wiles of the devil and to smoke him out of our ranks. We are in a twilight hour of the church. Twilight means to be in a place or, or neutrality. It is a place where things are not clearly defined yet. And that's what Apostle Saul said on Sunday. He says we are crossing over, but we're crossing over to possess. But yet, he says things are not clearly yet. Many people don't seem to understand where they're going, how they're going to do it, and what's there and what to expect. Just hold on. Just hold on. It is a place where things are not clearly defined. The precept twi means two, means between two lights, twilights. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 14 and 16, these words. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. Now, have you ever stopped and thought why God would say that? Because there are things that trans. Fur, and there's things that move in between these great lights. Now, Daniel of old and some of the others were diviners, and they could tell, they could read the face of the stars, and they could read the face of the sky, and they could tell you when seasons and times were about to move, when God was ready to move by his hand. Why? Because times and seasons were in his hands. So God says this, so in the very beginning, God always had a way for mankind, what he created, to see how his hand was going to move. So God said, let there be lights in the firmament and of the heavens to divide the day and the night. Got to keep these words in, in, in your heart just for a moment. And let them be for signs and seasons. For days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament, in the heavens, and to give light on the earth. So God, God is telling us there's going to be spiritual warfare. God is telling us there's going to be life in the spirit. God is telling us you're going to rightly discern season, times, days, and nights by the realm of the spirit. And God says, I want you to understand that here we are in these last days. God says, this is what he says in the book of Acts. He says, in these last days, this moon, the sun, he says, they're going to turn into blood. So God, once again, is telling us we need to keep our eyes in the realm of the spirit. God, once again, is telling us we need to look to the heavens because the heavens are going to show us when God's hand is about to move. And we're going to feel what God's hand is moving into this earth. And so now we're beginning to see the earth is shaking once again. And there's a tsunami coming. There's a movement of God that is stirring. I am telling you. And I and you cannot be left out in this move worrying about how I feel. Don't nobody care. Get a pill, get over it. But there are souls that God is going to snatch from the flame of hell. And God is going to need those who are strong in the Lord to know who they are, to lead different portions of this movement. Are you listening to me, Freeport? Are you listening to me, Faith Center Freeport? I'm talking to you. How God is going to do it, what it's going to look like, you won't know it as Apostle said. We're just going to keep living by faith and we're going to keep stepping. And when God speaks, we're going to hear. When the Holy Spirit moves, we're going to follow. It doesn't matter what it will look like now. We just have to recognize it when he moves. And get in the flow. So God goes on to say, he says there are going to be signs in the heaven for days and the years. 
and let them be for the lights and the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And then the Lord made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day. Isn't that funny? Jesus says, work while it's day. Now I want you to hear what God says. God said this greater light would rule the day and the lesser light to rule the darkness. Jesus says this, being God manifested in the flesh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light, the rule of the world. I want you to get that. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. Why would Jesus call you the rule, the light, or the rule of the earth? Why? Because it was all part of the dominion mandate. And then he says you would be the salt of the earth. What does salt do? It makes everybody thirsty. And so then Jesus comes along and he says, I want you to make everybody thirsty. And then he says, out of you will flow a river. So just keep making them thirsty and just keep on giving them something to drink. I said, God is stirring a mighty movement in our midst. And we need to keep our eyes on him and not get carried away with a bunch of foolishness. I had a lady call me not too long ago. And she was talking, I don't know, she was telling me something. It was just really weird. And my wife wasn't there, so I usually pass the phone to her. But she, she wasn't there. So I just put the phone down and just let her talk. Bless her heart. And, and, and when she got through talking, you know, because she, she, asked, she asked questions, she answered herself, asked questions, answered herself, asked questions. So I asked her. I said, why do you think you were born again? And the question just caught her completely. Of course, she didn't know. She didn't know how to answer the question. I said, well, why did you think Jesus came? And she says, Pastor, I don't know why Jesus came. I says, well, I want you to find that in the Bible and call me back. Now, you know, I think we need to start asking one another questions. Why did Jesus come? We say to seek and to save that which was lost, really. You think any human being can ever be lost from God? What was lost from mankind was God's authority. That's what was lost from man. And Jesus came back and he said, all authority has been given unto me. And he delegated that authority back to the people of God. Do you understand? That, that's the only thing that was lost. Adam forfeits his authority. But see, because we've been so indoctrinated with certain things, we talk like it, act like it, and walk like it. But when truth shows up, you can't argue with truth. In John, this is my last scripture, 1 John, verse 7, from the Passion Translation. But if you keep living in pure light, remember the light represented here, dominion, rule, and authority that surrounds him, Jesus, we share unbroken fellowship, koinonia with one another, and the blood of Jesus. Now, I want to pause there just for a moment because I want you to hear what the writer says. The writer says is that if we'll walk in dominion, rule, and authority, and then he says we have fellowship with Christ Jesus, then he says the blood. So, in other words, why Many people can't seem to get their complete healing is because they have broken fellowship. The Lord never separated fellowship, blood, dominion, rule, authority, and power. All of it was connected to the blood. So the reason why we can't see a lot of people get healing in the church because they have broken fellowship one with another. 
And so therefore, their rule, their dominion, and their authority when they open their mouth is not working for them. Have you ever wondered why your mountain won't move? Have you ever considered why your mountain is resisting or defying you? There must be a reason. So let me go back and read it again. So we share unbroken fellowship, quantity with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin, false accusations, and deceptions that become like giant clouds in our minds, accusations that do not come from our consequences, but accusations that come from our conscience, not out of our consequences. I think it is time for the church, the ecclesia, to mature itself in its mindset, in its love, in its walk, and in its faith. I think it is time for us to be delivered from old paradigms, old wineskins, and old religious structures that has kept us bound, that has set us against the leaders that God has appointed, that has set us against those who God has anointed, that has set us against those that God has called. We no longer believe the prophets. We no longer obey the apostles. And we no longer care for the shepherds. The church has a problem. And it is time, and I know in this church, it will not last in this church. Your apostle is not going to have it in this church. If he has to be the only one to preach to his wife, he will not have it in this church. Because God is moving. Are you listening to me? And none of us want to be left behind in this movement that God is stirring. Would you stand to your feet with me? Old songwriters say when I was in prison, I was sung in the choir. I didn't do very good, but I sung in it anyway. And there was a song that we used to sing every Sunday. It was something like, we come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. And you know, I used to sing that song. You know, we had our swearing pastor suit. <laughs> you know, we had our swing. You, you understand that? But I want you to hear what the song said. We came this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. All of us here in this very room has come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. And God is about to release a tsunami on this earth. I am telling you, if you would watch what's going on, God is shaking. There is a shaking going on. I'm telling you, there's a grassroot shaking that is going on. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the Spirit of God to just go whoosh. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. You mark it down this night here in this church. The Spirit of God is just going to suddenly go whoosh. And I'm telling you, when that happens, hell will shake. Governments of nations will shake like never before. And the power of God will be released. I'm telling you, people will get saved left and right. They will fall on their faces trembling. That's the day we're in today. Father, we come to you. We sense your presence in this place. We feel your power as it begins to surge. There's a swelling in the earth. Spirits of darkness and demonic powers are running rapid. People are looking for a hiding place. They sense a power, an awesome power. They sense it coming. They feel it on their their backside. They feel the breath of God breathing upon them. 
Nations are trembling. No one seems to know what you are doing. But there's a move of your spirit. There's a move of your spirit. There's a move swelling in our spirit that's moving us to fall upon our faces. That's causing us to rid ourselves. If anything, every cumbersome every weight, every sin. There's a purity of your spirit that is washing our sin-stained consciousness. There are robes that are being dipped in the blood. Duh. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit. Move, move, move in our hearts like never before. Bring us to note that you might rise us up in your power and your might. I feel it swelling. I feel it swelling in the neighborhoods. I see it swelling across the land. I feel the trembling of the Lord. I feel the trembling of the Lord. I feel the trembling of the Lord. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. Ah. Ah. And he says, the very post in his presence was shaken. Oh God, you got a remnant inside of a remnant that longs for you, Holy Spirit. Move, Spirit of God. Move, Spirit of God. We invite your presence. Move in our midst. Move in our midst. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus.